few years uh -huh. and uh, has served on the NDCA board as the president and has had teams in ELIMS and probably winning every major tournament, including a couple of national championships during the time she's been here. She's going to give us some information about the United States Space Program. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Tate. graduate uh, degree from here and coached here before heading off to uh, coach high school debate. So it's great to be back uh, to Denton. I have not gotten used to the heat yet. So it's amazing how quickly your body acclimates when you move to Chicago in regards to not uh, having the skin to take the heat anymore. But I think today might be a little cooler. I don't know. The humidity may be terrible. I've given you forewarning. I am using a software program. Uh, for the very first time, Prezi, I don't know if any of you all are familiar with it. I, if you have, if you are in my classes on a day-to-day -day experience, you know the technology could, can be my, my biggest enemy. I think things will be okay, but just kind of keep uh, in mind that I'm using kind of new technology and a new program. So, uh, hopefully all this uh, will go, usually when I have technical problems on the staff, one of you will come up and fix it for me. So, you, you can fix it for me? Huh? Okay, good. Good, good, good. Um, today's lecture, we're going to talk about the initial title of the lecture is supposed to be the history of U.S. space policy. Um, I adapted that a little bit to the history of the U.S. space program, and then when I kind of realized as I was putting through it, you can't really talk about the history of U.S. space policy, the history of U.S. space program, without talking about a lot of the international factors. So, today we're just going to kind of historically go through a timeline about important things that, you know, you're not going to have an argument about Sputnik 1, probably, um, in your debate. You're not going to have a plan that revolves around that, obviously. But it's important, I think, to know some of the just fundamental things that anchored our space program over the course of the world's space exploration since the 1950s. So we're certainly going to talk about key events. Uh, we're going to talk about some key policies and treaties that uh, are in effect today that actually probably will come up in some of your debates. We'll certainly spend some time in the 2000s decade uh, talking about some of the current projects that we have as well as Obama's uh, budget proposal uh, that he would like for 2012 in regards to what that has to do with NASA. So definitely I think a lot of this lecture is just to anchor you. So in cross-examination if you need to pull examples or whatever, you've got a little bit of a background of space <coughs> history as well as kind of getting us started to talk about uh, some of the current programs and uh, proposals. So uh, that is where we'll start. Um, we're going to get us first in the mood a little bit uh, by seeing some photos from NASA. I do not have volume. Can I fix that for me? <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Okay. 
just to maybe get us started a little bit in the mood. Um, in all honesty, from uh, the time that the space topic was first announced, I wasn't super excited. I'm not very science and techn technologically minded. But I'll be honest, um, I taught a, a short space unit to my novice debate one class at the end of the year this year, as well as getting you know materials ready and so forth for camp. It's hard when you see images like that, when you learn kind of about uh, the capabilities of what's going on in space, even for someone who is an English teacher that does not uh, think very scientifically or from a technological standpoint, it's hard not to get a little bit excited about it. Um, even if you're not someone that comes from a science and tech background, uh, you know, whether or not you're interested in military use of space, the use of energy, what space can do for our environment, uh, all of that, I, I think that all of you will find kind of a niche in this year's topic that really uh, will excite you. And um, what we're going to do, and I, this will be a little bit like the history class today, but we're going to kind of go through a timeline today and talk about the important events that have happened uh, in our outer space exploration. Certainly I could have started before the 1950s in regards to some technology that developed that made it possible for us to go to space, but uh, that lecture would have lasted much, much longer than the one I already have today. So we're going to start in 1950s. There will be some references uh, to some historical stuff that happened before then um, as you go through. But the 1950s really is the decade that started us off. Program where all you know 
uh, God bless America and all that. So just that, you know, I certainly think we've uh, gone a long way from uh, our views of the former Soviet Union, but unfortunately some of the videos still have that kind of ominous sound. Uh, we're going to first talk about the launch of Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2, which is part of the original Soviet Sputnik overall program that included a lot more than just those two launches. But these two launches really set uh, the world's space exploration going. Um, as we can see, the launch of Sputnik 1 happened in October 4th, 1957. Um, we'll talk uh, quite a great deal here a little bit about the United States' reaction to that. Um, but you do need to know that it is the first artificial satellite to be put in space. It's the first time we actually, you know, the human uh, kind is able to get something mechanical or artificial up in space. At the time, the United States had been attempting as well uh, to get a satellite into space as well under what is known as Project Vanguard. And they actually had two failed attempts at that. Uh, it was uh, directed through the U.S. military. And the launch of the Sputnik 1 came as a complete surprise uh, to the United States. Um, at the time, the Soviet Union, um, all of their, you know, space feelings were not made public like they are here in the United States. You can go and watch, you know, the space shuttles lift off and so forth. And so it wasn't until Sputnik 1 was launched and we actually, you know, could, could get, you know, we realized there were images being sent back down. Um, our initial reactions were that Sputnik 1 was, a, was some type of military device. Um, and caught, created quite a bit of panic in the first couple of days um, that Sputnik 1 was launched. But, you know, the, that hysteria simmered down a little bit. Um, it still caused the United States to be fairly reactive because um, it did solidify the belief now that the Soviet Union could launch an, you know, an intercontinental ballistic missile, which didn't also uh, sit too well with us since this is kind of the start of the Cold War. <coughs> so the U.S. reaction was one of hysteria initially because they didn't know what, the, what Sputnik was. They thought in and of itself it was a military device. It then created a, a little bit lesser of a panic, just the idea that the Soviet Union probably now had some military capabilities that we were not aware of. But it also created an embarrassment. Um, you know, the United States is kind of fresh, it's somewhat fresh off, you know, 10 years after World War II. The United States kind of wanted to be the, started growing as the man the world leader, and we kind of, you know, we got outraced by the Soviets in regards to who got that up first. So, um, it, you know, it created kind of a perfect storm for what will be called uh, the space race as soon as the United States entered it up. Sputnik 2 launched November 3rd, 1957, so only a month after the original Sputnik 1. Um, why that particular launch is famous is, does anybody know who Laika is or what Laika is? The dog. It's the dog. Um, first uh, living being that was put up into space. We've got a picture of Laika here. Um, Aww. Aww. Laika did not have a happy ending though. Um, she died within a few hours of Sputnik 2 being launched due to heat exposure. It was originally believed that she lived six or seven days and uh, passed away from lack of oxygen. But uh, it was actually only like 10 or 15 years ago that we kind of found out for sure that she died fairly close to lift off from uh, heat. Um, it is known that there was never really going to ever be an attempt to bring Sputnik 2 back to the Earth with Laika alive. So um, putting Laika on Sputnik 2, she had kind of a uh, doomed fate anyway. Believe it or not, and I shouldn't say believe it or not, there were some ethical protests that happened in regards to this. I think that this happens now. Um, you know, in a world that may be more politically aware about animal rights, there may be more, there would have been a little bit more of a search. She was a stray dog. There were three that were chosen to be trained to put on Sputnik 2, and she was chosen the winner as the loser. I don't know. I don't have anyone to refer to, but that is um, poor Lyca. But in fairness, just like a lot of other medical advances, certainly the idea of putting living beings up in space, there has been 